Well, uh, really nice to be here with everybody today. Um, hopefully we have some nice, uh, I have some nice pictures to share and inspire everybody for the growing season. Um, as Sarah said, I'm a master gardener. I worked for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for 34 years, mainly in water quality, but I have this hobby of gardening and I am fortunate enough uh, that I run a food pantry garden. So um, it matches up with my hobby and we grow three to 5,000 pounds of produce per year on about a quarter acre of land in the city of Rhinelander. It was an old school parking lot playground and I often find marbles and little uh, uh, army men and things in the garden. That's kind of fun. Uh, so we're going to talk today a little bit about seed and plant selection, starting those seeds, and then a little bit more about uh, season extenders and then garden preparation. Um, so, you know, some of these slides, like I said, I'm uh, almost at a commercial large grower operation here with, I don't know, probably several hundred tomato plants there. Um, we do give uh, plants away from our greenhouse to the clients of the food pantry, encouraging people to be more sustainable. Uh, but hopefully I can bring this down to a level that your average gardener uh, would appreciate instead of this uh, uh, almost commercial operation I'm running here. So there's some of our produce. Uh, again, we have a, a mission to grow food for hungry people. And uh, during the height of the season, about all we do is a harvest. Cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, onions, a whole host of uh, vegetables. So this kind of shows what we start with in Rhinelander, Wisconsin in March. My first job is to dig into the greenhouse uh, to to get it opened up and started running. Uh, and then hopefully uh, we end up in the bottom uh, right-hand corner there with a nice ripe tomato for our clients uh, sometime in August. I do uh, mainly like to grow vegetables, but I have a um, nice flower garden. And I've been slowly but surely uh, transferring over to all natives in my garden so that um, I can attract uh, some of those native pollinators. And we're going to talk about starting natives because they're a little bit more difficult than your average uh, pea to grow. Um, one of the things I like to do when I design a garden uh, is the view from the inside. Everybody's about curb appeal. Uh, uh, but I like to think also about what the garden looks like from inside your home. So here's my cat looking out the window at the garden, wishing she could be out there, but she's an indoor cat. Oh, there's those seed catalogs. Uh, some of my favorites are here as master gardeners. We cannot uh, recommend any uh, particular company. It's up to you. I am going to talk about some of these companies. So. Um, just because they uh, have uh, really good information in their catalogs. If you get no catalog other than just for the pictures, this Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, oh my gosh, send for that catalog. Uh, you'll be cutting the pictures out and framing them. They're so beautiful. Uh, some of my other favorites here are Johnny's. They kind of cater to larger growers such as myself, but they also sell it at smaller quantities. Fedco is like a seed co-op, uh, uh, very reasonable seed prices from uh, Fedco and you can buy larger quantities of seeds. Um, let's see, Seed Savers Exchange is down here in this corner, uh, kind of the heirloom uh, niche market again. I, uh, since we live in Wisconsin, I also, it's not in the montage here, but I also wanted to mention Jung Garden Seeds because uh, they have commercial stores here and it's also a Wisconsin company. So I do like to grow heirloom tomatoes. 
Um, most of our clients at the food pantry want a regular old beefsteak tomato, which those are very good too. Uh, but here's some of my favorites in this basket here. Uh, one right here is a green zebra. And then this one over here is black crim. And this is a Roma tomato right here uh, called San Marzano. That's what most of your tomato sauce is made out of. So that's just a few of my favorites in there. So here's the uh, San Marzano. And oh my gosh, since the pandemic started, the prices of seeds have gone out of this world, at least in my opinion. $5.40 for four seeds comes out to 13 cents a seed. Uh, you know, I suppose if you're only growing a few plants, that's not so bad. Uh, but I have started purchasing larger quantities of seeds and then I'll use them over a course of two or three years. Um, you can save seeds as long as they're stored in a cool, dry place. My kind of rule of thumb is up to five years. So by purchasing a larger quantity, uh, you'll save some money that way. But who can remember when seeds were 79 cents a packet? Now they're five, six dollars. So just one uh, tip on how to save uh, some money on seeds. And again, this is one of my favorite tomatoes, San Marzano. So now I'm going to talk about some of those catalogs that have really, really good information in them. So I'm endorsing the information, not the product that they sell. Uh, Prairie Nursery uh, is uh, in Westby, Wisconsin. Or, yeah, I may not have the right town, but it's central Wisconsin. And uh, so it's a Wisconsin company, but they have a wealth of information on their website and in their catalog about how to propagate and plant uh, native plants from seed. And that could almost be a program unto itself. There's different ways to stratify the seed, which is prepare it for germination, uh, dry uh, stratification, moist stratification. Scarification, which is like rubbing it with uh, sandpaper. And then there's some other ones over here that help germinate the seeds. A lot of uh, native plants have some pretty specific requirements for germination. And here's a chart in prairie nurseries. And you can see the kinds of information. The plant is on this side, lavender hyssop. It's dry stratification, and I'll show you a picture of that. And the uh, planting time is fall. So a lot of these uh, perennials uh, in the native category prefer to be planted in the fall and then be in the cold over the winter in Germany in the spring. So one way to trick a plant to germinate is to Put it in a tray like this with sand and then either moisten it or not, depending on the requirements for that plan. And you can put it outside in the wintertime for about a month. Uh, and then the plants will be ready to germinate and you can bring them in. And once they start germinating in this tray, you can start teasing them out and putting them into pots. And we'll talk more about that later. So that's just some tips on growing uh, some of those native plants you saw in my front yard garden the other picture or two ago. So this is the planting guide from Fedco Seed, again, available on their website or in their catalog. And again, I'm not endorsing Fedco Seeds. I'm just showing you the resources they have available in their category and over on the left side here is the vegetable and then uh, how many seeds there are per packet, uh, distance apart to plant them, where, what to thin them to, how far apart the rows should be planted, the depth of the seed. Uh, and then this is probably the most critical thing. A lot of people plant their seeds too early and then uh, the vegetable seeds don't germinate. They uh, probably are pretty soggy. And so they uh, 
uh, actually rot in the ground if you plant them when the temperature is too cool. So I'd really recommend if you're gonna do some gardening, a soil thermometer, and then you can look at these minimum and ideal temperatures for planting your seeds. And so you can see here, uh, pole beans going across here, your soil temperature has to be 60 degrees. So that's quite warm. It's gonna be the end of May for most of Wisconsin before you're gonna have soil temperatures that warm. So I think this is a really good guide. Again, you can download it online from Fedco Seeds or it's also in their catalog. So this is the last company where they have really good information and it's Johnny C and there they have videos, YouTube videos on just about every vegetable there is. And they're really good. And the one thing I like about Johnny's, uh, both in their catalog and on these videos, they'll end the video with a recipe. How perfect is that uh, to get a recipe for whatever you're growing? So I really like uh, the YouTube videos off of Johnny's seed. Of course, the best place to get your information on growing just about anything is the UW Extension Learning Store. Uh, one thing I like about the Learning Store is it's all science-based. It's been tested and verified. And so uh, you get the very best uh, information. So you just go to the website up there, Learning Store, Dot extension dot WISC dot edu, and you just type in there what you're growing and you'll get a fact sheet. This one on growing tomatoes, I think is about 12 pages long and it goes into just about every question you could ever ask about growing tomatoes, including you know disease management, which is the biggest question I get about growing tomatoes is how to uh, manage the diseases they get. And maybe we, if someone has questions about that, we can uh, cover it in uh, Q and A at the end. So really good information at the learning store. Uh, so that's just a, a sample of places where you can go. So seed starting, we're gonna start off on this little journey. And uh, the first thing is use a good commercial brand of seed starting mix. Uh, and just use it uh, sterilized right out of the bag. Don't add anything to it. A little later, once the seeds established, you can start uh, a fertilizing regime. But when the fer seeds first germinating, you need to have really good drainage in your soil. Otherwise, uh, the seedlings will be weak and some of them might even, after they uh, come up, it's called dampening off where the stem rots because it's too moist. Uh, so I would encourage people to underwater rather than overwater. But the seed starting mixture should be a commercial brand of seed starting mix. And it should have these little white granules in there that are called vermiculite uh, for drainage. Okay, pots. We, because I'm almost at a commercial scale, we could spend a lot of money on pots. So we do reuse pots. Uh, one of the things that really is um, disheartening to me is the amount of plastic that is disposed of uh, because gardeners uh, purchase plants uh, and when it could be reused. The only thing about reusing the plastic pots is they do need to be sanitized. I just use a Dawn detergent, maybe with just a little bit of bleach in it and soak the pots in there, rinse them out, and then uh, store them by size here in the garden shed. Uh, so there's lots of ways to do this. That's one way to reduce your impact on the environment. Um, sometimes I use trays like this and uh, for uh, just getting the seed to germinate, so these are really only a quarter inch deep or so. And you can see the tomato seeds on the surface here. Once the first, once the seed comes up, I tease it out and I put it then in the pot where I'm going to grow it. 
And this just makes sure there's one seed per pot. You don't want to have, or one plant per pot. You don't want to have uh, multiple plants in a single pot. So this is my best tool for seed uh, planting. And like I said, teasing those uh, uh, seedlings out of the soil to transplant them. But one thing that's nice about it is the eraser is an exactly a quarter of an inch. And so double lad is a half an inch and there's three quarters of an inch once you keep that part of the eraser. So it gets your planting depth down and you just have, you don't have to use a ruler or anything like that, just use the eraser part. Uh, we'll also talk about how a number two pencil is the best tool for labeling your plant labels. So there's lots of uh, commercial stuff you can buy out there. We're gonna talk about a few of those. These are peat pots. One thing about these peat pots is they look like the roots should go through them, but they don't. So if you plant anything in any of these peat pots, I always encourage people to rip off the bottom so the roots can get out. Otherwise they get root bound in that uh, little pot there and the roots don't go out into the soil. So uh, if you're gonna use these, you tear them apart and you tear out the bottom and then you can plant the whole thing. So why go purchase these when you have egg cartons in your house and they could serve that same uh, purpose. Uh, egg cartons are you know, wood fiber and they will decompose. Again, you'd wanna make sure that you have some drainage in the bottom, poke a hole in the bottom so the water drains out. And then if you do plant the little cells out into your garden, be sure to uh, take the bottom off so the roots can get out. Um, so all about uh, gardeners. And I think one of the reasons we're, we're gardeners is because you know we're too cheap to spend the money on the commercial products and we're always looking for the garden hack. Uh, so these are really nice. And I do like these a lot, not a recommendation. It's just an alternative to reduce waste more than anything. Uh, the bottom is rubber and you can just push it up and the plant comes out. Uh, the one thing I like about these is they're really uh, easy to clean afterwards. You just rinse them out. And then I put them in my dishwasher and they're completely sanitized and ready to be used. Uh, the next time around. Uh, and so they are uh, reusable. I've had the menus using some of these for four years and they're still in really good uh, shape. So it's just a way to uh, save uh, on the plastic disposals issue I talked about. Oops, wrong way. All right, so here's even a cheaper way. Uh, clamshell that we all get, uh, we've been getting over the COVID. You get your uh, salad to go at the grocery store, wash it out, clean it up, and then use the paper roll toil trick, paper roll trick to plant your uh, seedlings. And then the clamshell provides a dome to keep the moist uh, plant or the seed moist during germination. Uh, it's really important if you're going to dome your plants with plastic like this that you open it up at least once a day for an hour, uh, just to vent all that moisture out. Uh, you can uh, uh, overdo it on the moisture. But uh, you can also water from the bottom, so the water wicks up, and uh, the clamshells are really a, a neat uh, garden hack. So again, here's trays under the domes, uh, but again, uh, you want to take those domes off and you want to use them just during seed germination. Once the plants are up, they really need the air and the sun. And so remove those uh, domes as soon as the seedlings start emerging from the soil. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about labeling. And also in this picture is uh, uh, an insect uh, problem that you can have when uh, having all this moist soil around. First of all, if you're at a rummage sale and you see blinds, uh, grab them 
that's what these are. I just cut up the blinds. Uh, you know, if they're an old uh, damaged blind that you can often get for a dollar or less, you can have uh, several hundred plant labels just from that and you just cut them up. And again, the best thing to label your plants on, you can go out and buy these fancy permanent markers and all that stuff. At the end of the summer, most of that's going to be faded, but a number two pencil you can always read. And then next year when you reuse it, all you need is a rubber eraser, erase off the old label and put the new label on and you're good to go. So it's all about reducing that waste again. Then you see this little uh, plastic uh, piece of yellow here. That's a sticky trap. And one of the common problems when you're growing seedlings are fungus gnats. And you might have these on your household plants too if it's really moist. And so uh, these sticky traps, the uh, little uh, fungus gnats get stuck on them and you kind of interrupt the life cycle uh, that way. So this is uh, my plant labels and this is how I keep them straight in my garden. Uh, so you can see here, up here, this is my rain garden that's in back, and here's all the plant labels. Sometimes when people come to my garden, they ask me what a plant is, and I can not have a perfect memory every time about the plants. And so I have this in my garage so I can quick go look it up and make sure I got the right variety, and et cetera. Um, and this, to me, is better than leaving the plant label in the garden because then they can be blown away or dug up by squirrels or get misplaced. And this is just my sort of filing system for the plants that I have in my garden. And again, it's in my garage and it's each one of these squares is a different area in my garden in the yard. So just a little trick of the trade there. So when you're watering seedlings, um, you really don't want to pour the water in with a watering can and a spray can is the best thing. Um, we talked a little bit about watering from the bottom and you can do that in some situations, but um, I think uh, for the most natural is the hand sprayer and that way the water soaks down through the medium and comes in contact with the seed and then it will dry out to between a little bit during watering. It will help with the fungus net problem. So if you're going to grow anything indoors uh, in March, um, I really would recommend lighting. Um, I grew lettuce in my garage all, and it's a partially heated garage all winter long under LED lighting. Many of us used to use fluorescent lighting, but I have to tell you that LED lighting is so much better and it conserves energy also. So if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do any growing of seedlings indoors during the winter time, when the sun through the windows is not all that strong, I really would recommend an LED light. And many of those are uh, reasonably priced in a lot of the catalogs. Um, and they are uh, way better than even the full spectrum uh, fluorescent lights. Uh, so, okay, a little bit about season extenders. If you have somebody handy around the house, a cold frame is a really nice thing to have. have. And you can get your plants started just as well in this coal frame as you can in the greenhouse behind it. Uh, you know, you can see over in this corner here, that's still a snowbank. Uh, so this is probably early April. And uh, as long as you close these coal frames up at night, uh, most of your cool season crops will do quite well in a cold frame and give you a jump start on the growing season. Um, so I, you know, really kind of a handy thing. And if you just uh, Google it on the internet, there's all kinds of uh, uh, 
designs out there for making your own. And then they also have uh, a lot of the catalogs have pre-made cold frames, but it's if you're just a small gardener. I think a small cold frame just uh, gets you started a little bit earlier in the spring when we're all itching to do some growing, but uh, the weather isn't quite cooperating yet. Another thing you can do is use a floating row cover. So this is, I didn't know, even know I could grow romaine lettuce this beautiful, but I did. Um, and this lettuce just survived in this floating row cover, 23 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So it's way, way below sea, uh, zero but that uh, screen on top of it was just enough protection from frost that the uh, lettuce heads were not bothered whatsoever. And so with this technique, I was harvesting uh, nice heads of lettuce like you see on the picture on the right sometime, that's probably the end of April. So it just gives you a jump start on the growing stuff season. I also use uh, something called a cloche, which is just like a lot of people just use a milk jug and you can cover the plant uh, and take it off on sunny days and you can get a, um, a jump start. The only thing I would say about doing this season extension, it's for cold season crops like lettuce, cabbage, uh, broccoli, tomatoes and peppers and warm season crops. You really have to wait till that temperature warms up to plant those. And uh, it just doesn't work as well to try to do season extension on tomatoes. So uh, now we're gonna talk about preparing the soil. The soil is the foundation of your gardening. And so you wanna make sure you're caring for it, uh, adding compost. You can see here, that there's uh, lots of uh, garden debris in there that'll all decompose and feed your plants. Now, um, we used to have a big Troy built rototiller and I would uh, rototill this whole garden. It will, took me several days of uh, jarring rototilling to get everything done. And through studies that UW Extension has done, um, they're finding that tilling actually damages your soil and destroys the soil structure. And the other thing about your soil is it's a living, breathing organism. And so a lot of the microorganisms are disturbed by the tilling. And so this is the new way to uh, prepare your garden. And I have a little video here showing me how, showing you how it's done. So hold on if the, everything works right shouldn't come on. Are the audio's working? <laughs> Are you on timer? No, I just, I'll trim it when I'm done. Gonna narrate it or anything like that. I think my head's cut off. <laughs> there are all these garlic here. Yeah, garlic is looking good. Asparagus is coming up according to Jan. So I think you get the uh, gist of what I'm doing there. It's called a broad fork, and it takes me to do a 25 foot roll. It takes me um less than five minutes it's pretty easy to do um a lot of the women i garden with at the garden are able to use it it's not that difficult and it's far better than standing uh, behind a rototiller the other thing when you rototill you're bringing up all the weed seeds and this just prepares the soil bed without bringing up uh, the weed seeds to the surface where they'll germinate. So you'll have far less weeding uh, and you're only tilling the portions uh, where you're gonna be growing. So you're not tilling between the rows and that kind of stuff. 
this has cut our labor, I would say, in half uh, because it's uh, it's really quick to do. And uh, sometimes people are, I probably should get another broad fork because my volunteers are all fighting over who gets to do the broad forking because it's kind of lethargic and fun to do. So anyway, move on. Oh, talking about soil. We have to talk about jumping worm. Uh, it's uh, an Asian invasive species, and it's really, really, really a bad thing for your soil. You can see up here in the corner what it does to the soil. It makes it like granules. Uh, it consumes everything, all the compost and dead material and uh, it's really, really bad for your soil. And we as gardeners um, have been guilty of spreading this when we share plants with other people. And so um, you know, I think it's still okay to share plants with other people as long as you're absolutely sure you don't have jumping worm. It's, it spreads by microscopic eggs that you really can't see. And so there's sometimes if you've potted up a plant from your garden and all you need is one egg because it reproduces asexually uh, in that pot and then the next gardener will have the problem. Uh, so a lot of master gardener associations have stopped uh, selling plants out of their gardens because that's just one way to spread it. And I do have for my garden uh, kind of a ban on bringing in plants from other gardeners just because I want to make sure that we don't get jumping worm. Okay. So now um, we're just going to go through some nice pretty pictures because it's uh, winter time and uh, we're not that far from rhubarb and asparagus. Uh, season. We grow a lot of rhubarb, a lot of asparagus. Uh, the customers at the food pantry, they really like it. And we bundle it up in packages of pie or enough for a meal and off it goes to the pantry. Uh, so this is uh, an old time rose called William Baffin. It needs no protection. It uh, is winter hardy here in zone three and it blooms like crazy here. So it's a great plant. And uh, it's also attracts pollinators to our garden. So that's a good thing. It's not a native plant, but there are some native roses or bees are used to using uh, things from the uh, rose family. And uh, as you can see there, it's uh, quite the stunning picture and it is tough. Um, so since we're in an extension program, I thought I would highlight how important it is to eat a rainbow of colors. Uh, and it's nothing better than having grown it yourself. You know exactly where it came from and how you grew it. So, uh, but it's always important to eat a variety of fruits and vegetables in your diet. So another reason we uh, grow the native flowers at least, and this is cup plant, is for the wildlife, particularly the pollinators. You can see a monarch butterfly here, really loves the cup plant. And then if you look closely up here, there's a, a, a bumblebee. So uh, it's really uh, something that's really beneficial. Pollinators have been struggling and so having native plants in your garden is a good way to help them out. And of course, uh, a lot of you who might be gardeners know that um, much of our uh, produce, let's just back up here. Um, for example, tomatoes will self-pollinate, uh, but anything in the cucurbit family, the cucumbers, the squash, this uh, yellow neck squash, this, Turk's head squash here, the zucchini, yellow zucchini here. All of those require cross-pollination. They have a male and a female flower. And so without a bee, you don't have uh, these vegetables or foods. 
So it's really important to support our pollinators because they support the food system that we rely on. So I could do a whole program on growing garlic, uh, uh, but this is, I just thought I'd show you a picture of our garlic. Uh, I forget what we got. It was close to hundred pounds of garlic last year. Um, one thing about planting garlic is you plant that in the fall, not the spring. You separate the bulb, take the cloves of garlics, you plant them about two inches deep, and you put some straw over the top, and they'll be the first thing up in the spring. As soon as the snow melts, and even they sometimes they come through the snow, uh, they really uh, are fun to grow. Um, uh, sea garlic can be somewhat expensive to buy from a commercial grower. What I often tell people, if you've got a really good grower at your farmer's market and you can pick out some nice big fat juicy bulbs that you know, only takes maybe four or five bulbs that you can buy for maybe two dollars a piece as opposed to paying I don't know I've seen six seven dollars for sea garlic so I would just get a nice juicy bulb from your farmer's market and you can have a nice harvest of garlic. Again, uh, the native uh, plants, we'll see if I can, uh, uh, you know, you can see the purple coneflower here, Joe Pieweed here. These are brown-eyed Susans. Um, there's more of the cup plant in the background. Uh, so I like to grow it all uh, like it would be in nature. Um, one of the things about growing it dense like this, rather than having a plant set off by itself and then mulch around it, is uh, it's more natural, and you know it's going to have uh, more uh, attraction again to those pollinators because you've got a variety of flowers here, and so you'll attract a larger variety of bees and butterflies to your garden. So. Um, it also, in my mind, when you grow it like this, uh, kind of humble jumble, like it would be in nature, um, it's just as beautiful as taking a walk in a field of flowers. Oh, there's the rainbow again. I uh, can't beat that uh, drum enough. Uh, eggplant and cucumbers, green, uh, green peppers, just uh, some of the harvest from our garden. I wanted to uh, talk just a little bit about carrots here, right in the background. We grow a lot of carrots and um, we have found the best thing to do for growing carrots is to splurge a little bit and buy pelleted seed. So it comes in a little clay pellet and anybody who's grown carrots know they're really fine and the seed is really hard to plant. Uh, and the, most people just end up scattering it on the ground and then they're planted too dense and then you have to thin them out. And it's just a lot of work. Whereas if you get this little pellet that you can hold between your fingers and you just plant it very shallow, carrots should only be an eighth of an inch deep. So they should really just be planted almost on the surface. It really makes planting carrots uh, much better. You can also buy pelleted seed for lettuce, which is that very fine seed again uh, and difficult to handle. And those pellets, uh, you can get one seed in your pot and it's um, much easier to handle the seeds using the pelleted seed. So this is the curb appeal. That's the opposite of the picture that you saw at the beginning. I showed you the picture from the view inside the house, uh, but uh, it's equally nice for the curb appeal picture. And again, I'm slowly but surely uh, transferring over to more natives. One thing that I always want to make sure I have in my garden for pollinators is right here, and that is uh, dill. Um, Dill comes up and it has an umbel head, what they call an umbel head. 
and it is really good for attracting pollinators, but it also attracts beneficial insects uh, to your garden. Uh, and so if you have some of these predatory wasps or those kinds of insects in your garden, you're gonna have your insect population in balance. You're always gonna have some pests that go after your plants, but by having these uh, plants that attract beneficial insects, you're looking for to balance the population out so that the really pesty stuff is taken care of naturally rather than spraying a chemical. Uh, who doesn't love here uh, ladybugs? Or not ladybugs, uh, lightning bugs. Uh, they're so neat to see them out in the yard in the June, in the twilight, seeing the lightning bugs uh, fly around your garden. Um, what you probably didn't know is those lightning bugs are predators on slugs. So if you can attract some lightning bugs to your garden, you'll have uh, less slugs on your hostas or vegetables or whatever. So uh, I always try to emphasize rather than uh, reaching for the spray run to uh, uh, reach for another plant and uh, add a plant to your garden so that you have that uh, balance. Oh, that's what I have prepared for today, but now we can talk about anything. Are there any questions for Tom? There is one in the chat and it, how do we tell the difference between jumping worms and the worms that we want? Um, so let's go back up to the photo. Oh, it was down. Hold on. Going too fast. Um, it has a band in the middle that is light gray, um, almost white. Um, so uh, now I'm getting the spinning wheel, so I haven't pushed too many buttons. <laughs> and uh, we'll get back to it. There it is. So uh, this little band here is white. Uh, that's the first thing. And then I should have put a video up for this too. They wiggle and worm around way more. They're way more active than your average garden worm uh, that you would want to promote in your garden. Uh, so they're really wiggly. Uh, and that's why they're called uh, jumping worms. Uh, they're really prevalent, and I'd say um, the southern third of the state, so in particularly our bigger cities, Madison, Milwaukee, all have problems with jumping worms. And then it's a little bit more hit and miss. But uh, like I said, the biggest way they travel is either in compost or soil. So make sure you're getting, if you're hauling in compost or soil into your garden, Make sure it's from a reliable source that you know doesn't have jumping worms. Uh, so commercially available. And again, the two characteristics to look for are this white band, and then they uh, really wiggle. I'm on mute, so you cannot hear me ask the question. We have more questions in the chat, but we'll, we'll just jump really quick to the one that's related to the last question. How do we get okay. rid of the jumping worms if they're in the soil? That's the problem. That's why you don't want them. They're very, they're, right now, there's no way to treat for them or to eliminate them. You just kind of have to learn to live with them. Like a lot of invasives, the initial invasion will be really a lot. And you'll go, oh my gosh, you'll, this is terrible. And I had a good friend who had them and she just thought it was the end of the world. But like a lot of stuff, it reaches a peak and then it starts to come down. 
but it will still always impact your soil and it'll be really difficult. I suppose one way uh, to battle jumping worm if you had them was to do more container gardening. And you know maybe that can be a topic for next year because that's a whole topic unto its own. But that way you could kind of isolate your soil from the invasive species. Yeah. Uh, what, was the, what was the name of that hardy rose, old time rose? It's called William Baffin, B-A-F-F-I-N. And it's generally pretty available at commercial growing centers. Uh, maybe not your Walmarts and your places like that, but uh, more of your hometown uh, small business uh, purveyor of plants will have those quite often. And then another question in the chat, did you say to plant dill uh, in with your native flowers? Yeah, dill is a great plant for those. Uh, most of your dill and parsley are host plants for swallowtail butterflies. There's another reason uh, to plant, but a lot of your herbs are uh, have that humble flower that's flat, and then the insects like to land on that. And so they attract a lot of those beneficial, the two best being parsley, like I said, and uh, dill, but there's other things, anise, you know, a lot of the herbs are really beneficial. And you can always put some on your salad too. Uh, and then another question is, when do you start seedlings? Oh gosh, I can't believe I didn't talk about that. It's way too early. I know we all want to get started, uh, but it is way, way too early, particularly tomatoes and peppers. You know, what you'll end up with is a big, tall, lanky plant. So four, maybe five weeks before you can plant them outdoors is the best time to plant a tomato seedling. For us here in Rhinelander, that's as late as the third week in April. Uh, the one thing I see a lot of people doing is planting their tomato plants way too early. And, you know, we're in the northern third of the state. So we usually plant the first week of June. And your soil temperature should be um, right in that 50 degree range, 50 to 60 degree. If you plant too early, um, they'll survive. I won't say that, but what happens is the roots all retract because it's, the soil is too cold. And then the plant is set back and then it spends most of the summer trying to recover. Uh, and uh, so there's no benefit. And who hasn't uh, planted a tomato plant and then had a volunteer come up next to it and have it do better than the rest of their tomato plants? So it really is a factor of degree days that causes your tomatoes to ripen. And uh, a longer growing season is not all that necessary. Now, having said that, there are some really long, like, um, some of the heirlooms have really long growing periods, so they're really difficult to pull off uh, when they have a you know 110 day to ripening growing period. It's really hard to pull some of those off, uh, but they also taste the best. So, but the biggest thing is watch your uh, soil temperature four to six weeks before the planting time. Uh, for tomatoes and peppers, get them under some LED lighting. They'll really do much better. Um, some people, to strengthen the stem, will put a little fan on it. And so it's like it's being out in nature more. And that'll stiffen up the stem a little bit. The other thing you want to do before you plant your tomato plants out is to harden them off a little bit. So put them outside during the daytime and give them some uh, natural light, sunlight, and that'll get them used to being out there. But always wait until your soil temperature 
is in that 50 to 60 degree range. I find an easy way to weather my plants before they go to the garden is I will have them in the back of the garage by a, a west window, but also putting them in my wheelbarrow, I can take it out during a nice day and then put it back in the garage. Yep, I have a little red wagon just for that purpose. And then just roll it out and you roll it back in. And again, a cold frame is a, is a huge, uh, nice thing to have uh, in your back, tucked away in your backyard where you can tuck those plants in. And then all you have to do is close the lid. But the wheelbarrow, little red wagon, that works too. And a fan. A fan helps if they're in the house. Correct. Or anywhere. But you want to get them strong so they don't get lanky. Yeah. I have found the LED lights. I used to grow under fluorescent and that was more difficult. And of course now uh -huh. I use the, the greenhouse here. Um, and this, it does have heat too. So really it's, I'm, I'm cheating. I know it's a, a diff more difficult to start them on your windowsill than it is yeah. in a, a nice greenhouse like this, but LED there lights is. have, have made the big difference there. And of course, a lot of, not in Wisconsin, but a lot of the commercial pot growers or marijuana growers in other states have uh, perfected some of these. Uh, they make growing tents that are out of aluminum. And so you can uh, purchase a lot of those kinds of things and uh, set up a pretty good growing operation of your own, except you're growing food. Uh, but there's, they're more <laughs> available, you know, on the internet and stuff. It's kind of interesting. That's sort of related to our next question, which is if using glow light tables, what temperature do you need to keep the area with the tables? Um, this person is wondering if they can keep them in their garage. Um, so it kind of depends on the plant a little bit. Uh, the cool, cool season you can do in the garage. Uh, so your lettuces, cabbages, as long as you can keep the temperature uh, above zero. Tomatoes and peppers are going to require warmer temperatures. They're kind of the babies of the uh, seedling world. A lot of people use uh, a heated seed mat. Uh, so it's just a mat that lies on the table that just warms the bottom of the pot. Uh, and it's, uh, you just plug it into the wall and it keeps the soil warm, which is what you want to do. Um, so that helps, particularly with peppers, like warm soil for growing. Tomatoes will germinate. They'll just do better if you can keep them in that 68 to 70 degree range. Thanks. And we have a few more questions in the chat. So just uh, somebody did Google um, some information on jumping worms. That's also in the, the chat that talks about um, a member of the UW Arboretum in Madison talks about how to detect them with mustard solution poured over a small area of soil. So that's um, interesting. And they also posted the link in the chat if anyone's interested. Um, Ruth says, how timely. I'm excited about spring now and new plants and a robin just landed in the tree outside of our office window. Um, are there native plants that will grow well in the shade? There are. Um, so I, again, I can't recommend uh, the grower, but uh, Prairie Nursery, again, has groups of plants uh, uh, for shade, partial shade, full sun. Uh, so you don't have to buy your plants there. You can grow them from seed uh, or buy them somewhere else, but they have really, really good information. Now, in general, for a deep shade, you're not going to have the spectacular flowers Although there's, there's a few that do flower nicely, it's just not going to be quite as nice as the full sun gardens I was showing you. Uh, but Prairie Nursery has them grouped. And I think Prairie Moon Nursery does has similar res resources on their website where they have groups of plants for shade and groups of plants for sun. I'm going to post that in the chat. I found the link to that nursery. So. That's posted in the chat. And then the next question, let's see, where am I? 
uh, is from our group, our big group in Kiwanee County. Uh, do you suggest we clean out flower, flower gardens in the spring beforehand or late in the fall? The only cleanup I do, and it, again, it is for the benefit of the pollinators because a lot of them overwinter on the stems or various parts of the plant. So I will go through my garden and pull out any diseased material and get rid of that separate in the fall. And then I leave the plants up, um, you know, to provide habitat. And, you know, you really should leave them up until it's a little warmer. Um, you know, it's kind of, I do it in stages. So I try to have parts of my garden that are not cleaned up all the way till almost, uh, you know, almost the end of May, uh, probably doing the last of the garden cleanup. And that's just to leave that habitat in place um, and uh, allow those pollinators to complete their winter cycle. Uh, I know a lot of uh, communities are doing no mow May, where they don't mow their lawn uh, until after a lot of these insects are up and, and out of the ground. Uh, so it's a, a popular thing for people to do. I tried it last year. It was really difficult. I was going to tell you. The lawn was a little bit shaky by the time Memorial Day came around. But uh, I, I felt good anyway. And I got other things to do in the spring other than mow my lawn. So. Yeah, we did that too. It took forever for our lawn to recuperate, I think. <laughs> we'll still do things. <laughs> um, so I, there was another question around starting seeds in the greenhouse or in the house. And then when do you start the seeds to begin with? And I think we already um, answered that question. Yeah, I mean, read your seed packet is what I should be saying there because it will tell you. For example, I, I, it's been a long time since I grew onions because they're really difficult to grow. But you start those in the end of January, believe it or not. Uh, so those uh, growing onions from seed is like a full-time job from February all the way till they plant it out. Now you plant them out early uh, into April, but uh, it's it's you've got to be in it for the long haul. So the best thing to do is. Uh, Consult your seed packet, look at it, that FEDCO uh, chart. It has planting times on there. Uh, you have to be careful though, because it's for a different uh, growing zone. So you may not match the dates. Um, and I, that's why I always use the soil temperature chart. Which I also posted in the chat. Um, so last question, um, have you made pollinator hotels by drilling holes in wood and how has that worked for you if you've done this? Before? Yeah, I do. They're all over the place in my garden. Uh, and you're looking to attract mason bees. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a couple others. Those are all, again, uh, predatory uh, bees that uh, prey on other insects in your garden and you're looking to maintain that balance. Uh, I, uh, let's see here if I can find them. So th this, oh, I keep going too fast. There, this plant has a very thick stem and uh, if I cut up those thick stems, they're hollow. You don't even have to drill the hole. And it's a natural mason bee uh, house. I just strap them together. And it, you know, the mason bees just use that because they, it already has the hole there. No drilling involved. And it's kind of their natural habitat, what they would normally use. Uh, so I'm, I'm big on this plant because uh, it has that uh, ability to host the mason bees. Thank you. Oh, and somebody says, what is that plant? Quick, before we close out. What? What is that plant that you were talking about? Oh yeah, it's called, it's called cup plant, C-U-P plant. 
And um, just a word to the wise, it does spread in your garden and it's big. Uh, it's like 10 feet tall. So you got to have the space for it to grow. Um, one of the things it does out on the prairie though, you get that uh, big plant and it's waving in the breeze like that. That's what brings the pollinators to your garden because they see it uh, from a distance waving and then the pollinators come to your garden because it's so tall. Wow, very neat. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us today, Tom. And thank you everyone for asking all the, the excellent questions. There was comments in the chat about how beautiful your pictures are and how you're also a photographer and videographer in addition to being a master gardener. So thank you so much for sharing everyone. I uh, did post the evaluation link in the chat. Um, there's still some people sharing some things in the chat, so I'll, I'll save that as well. And if there are any um, follow-up questions, I can um, get those answers for you. So thank you 